Now, at the beginning of the 19th century and throughout the century, unmarried women who had achieved adulthood and widows were still able to conduct themselves as femme sol. So they were women who stood alone. They could conduct business, they could sign contracts, they could sue and be sued. They were basically responsible for their own actions and their own futures. Married women, on the other hand, immediately took on the status of the femme covert. That is, marriage was to them a civil death. And during the period of their marriage, there was a long-term suspension of basically their civil existence. They had no longer any direct relationship to their government. No right to independently contract business, no right to control their own property. Although some of these things were just beginning to change with the women's rights movement of the pre-Civil War era. The first married women's property law, for instance, um, was actually the same year as the Seneca Falls Convention, 1848 in New York. Now, the one demand that the Seneca Falls women did not make in the Declaration of Sentiments was they did not ask for suffrage. Many of these women, I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't just a practical consideration, although it was also that. Many women's rights activists in the early 19th century actively objected to the idea of having the vote. And that was something that actually divided the women's movement of the time and would continue to divide that movement. But instead, the rights and privileges that these women were asking for were simply the right to some kind of civil existence, some kind of recognition that they were individuals with a direct relationship to their government, that their identity wasn't simply covered over by that of their husband upon marriage. They wanted to be able to manage their own money, their own property, they wanted access to better education. They wanted respect for their abilities. They wanted to be able to go out into the public sphere and improve the public morality through their inherent feminine capability for moral purity and moral influence. So this is where it sort of all ties back to the domestic ideal that simultaneously disempowered and empowered women.